Hi, welcome to Happy Now Olivia, a channel dedicated to the pursuit of happiness. Because you don't have to wait, you can be happy now. I'm Olivia. Today I'm going to talk about Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Stephen Covey was a visionary who worked for more than 30 years consulting, advising, training, and teaching business, leadership, and management development. He earned an MBA at Harvard University and a doctorate at Brigham Young University. And in 1989, he published his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which has sold over 25 million copies worldwide. By the end of his life, Covey had met with 31 heads of state, including four presidents of the United States. Covey never took credit for inventing or creating the seven habits. He believed that his calling was to identify and organize them into a framework people could understand and apply to their lives, because the seven habits are based on timeless, universal, self-evident principles common to every enduring and prospering society throughout history. Covey believed that in our ever-changing world, we needed principles that don't change. Today, so many people are trying to take shortcuts around the principles of life. They want love, but not commitment. They want success without paying the price. They want the fruits of good character without good character. Covey developed the seven habits to anchor these principles in his own heart and in the hearts of others. He wanted to point out that the consequences for ignoring these principles would result in a shipwrecked life. This book has had an incredible positive impact in my life. It's the kind of book you find at the self-help section in a bookstore. I never used to look at that section. This book came into my life because my wife read it in high school, and about five years ago she decided to read it again. And afterwards she said, Olivia, you should read this book. I said, mm, I don't do self-help books. No, really. This one's different. You really should read it. Okay, I guess for the sake of our loving relationship, I will reluctantly read this book. I actually listened to it while driving, one of two books I've ever listened to, and it had a life-changing impact. It gave me a sense of awareness of the power inside me to be the best version of myself. I don't listen to books, but the reason this one was special in that regard was because Stephen Covey himself does the narration, and you can hear his soul in his expressions and his tone. Some of the habits I was already doing, some were new to me. Over the past five years, I've been trying to follow all of them. In order to make this video, I read the book. Reading is a different experience of truly connecting with the wisdom in the pages of a book. I highly recommend The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It has changed my life, and I know it has the potential to influence yours for the better in some way. Before I go over The Seven Habits, I want to go over some of the common human challenges we face and some concepts Stephen Covey identified to help us understand how the seven habits work. Some of the common human challenges we face are fear and insecurity. Today, people are gripped with a sense of fear for the future. They're afraid of losing their jobs and not being able to provide for their family. But this leads to living without taking risks and becoming codependent with people at home and at work. And other challenges, I want it now. Money, flashy car, entertainment system. I want it now and I deserve it. Our credit card society has made it easier to get now and pay later. Blame and victimism is another challenge. Our society is addicted to finger pointing and playing the victim. If only my boss wasn't so controlling. If only my kids weren't so rebellious. If only I had a bigger house. If only I hadn't inherited such a bad temper and such bad genes. Blaming everything and everyone else for our problems chains us to them. The supreme power of choice lies in the people who are humble enough to take, to accept and take responsibility for their actions and take whatever initiative necessary to work through their problems. The children of blame are cynicism and hopelessness. When we believe we're victims of our own circumstances, we lose hope and drive and settle into stagnation and resignation. The contrasting principles of growth and hope are the discovery that we are the creative force of our lives. Stephen Covey did in-depth research into the success, self-help, and popular psychology literature published in the 200 years since the founding of the United States in 1776. He realized that much of the success literature published in the last 50 years since his book came out in 1989 was so all superficial, 
filled with social image consciousness techniques and quick fixes, band-aids and aspirin that were treating acute problems and sometimes appeared to solve them, but left chronic underlying problems untouched to fester and resurface time and again. He called this the personality ethic. In contrast, all the literature published in the first 150 years since, the, since this country's founding focused on what Stephen Covey called the character ethic as a foundation for success. Integrity, humility, temperance, fidelity, courage, justice, industry, patience, modesty, simplicity, and the golden rule. The character ethic taught that these are the basic principles of effective living, that a person can only experience true success and enduring happiness as they learn to integrate these into their basic character. After World War I, the view of success shifted from the character ethic to the personality ethic, and success became a function of personality, public, ish, public image, attitudes, behaviors, and techniques. That doesn't mean that some aspects of the personality ethic, like influence strategies and positive thinking, are not beneficial and sometimes essential for success, but they're secondary traits, not primary traits of greatness. We have to sow the foundation of character in order to reap the fruits of success. Think of cramming for school. You may be able to get by. You may even get good grades. But if you don't pay the price day in and day out, you don't achieve mastery of the subjects you study, and you don't develop an educated mind. What would it look like to cram on a farm? Forget to plant in the spring, play all summer, and cram in the fall to bring in the harvest. The farm is a natural system. The price must be paid and the process followed. There are no shortcuts. You always reap what you sow. Secondary traits alone have no permanent worth in long-term relationships. If there isn't deep integrity and fundamental character strength, eventually true motives will surface and failure will replace short-term success. In before understanding the seven habits, we have to understand our own paradigms and how to make a paradigm shift. A paradigm is a model, a theory, a frame of reference. It's the way we see the world, not in the visual sense, but in understanding, per perceiving, and, and interpreting. Stephen Covey used the metaphor of a paradigm as a map. A map is not the territory. It's, certain, it's an explanation of certain aspects of the territory. Suppose you want to get to Dallas, but through a printing error, you have a map of Kansas City. You could work on your behavior. Try harder. Be more diligent, double your speed, but all your efforts would only succeed in getting you to the wrong place faster. You could work on your attitude, think more positively, but you still end up in Kansas City and not Dallas. Now, you could think so positively that you'd be happy no matter where you are, but the point is that you'd be lost. The problem has nothing to do with behavior or attitude and everything to do with having the wrong map. Now, if you have the right map of Dallas, then diligence becomes important. And when you encounter obstacles along the way, attitude can make a real difference. We interpret everything we see through our own paradigms. We seldom question their accuracy, and we're usually unaware they're even there. We simply assume the way we see the world is the way it is or the way it should be. How many times have you judged a person or situation and then gotten more information and then realized that your assumptions were incomplete or wrong. Each of us thinks we're being objective, but we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are, or as we have been conditioned to see it. The personality ethic tries to change outward behaviors and attitudes, doing little good in the long run, if we fail to examine the paradigms from which these attitudes and behaviors flow. A paradigm shift is a break with tradition with old ways of thinking, with old paradigms. The United States is the fruit of a paradigm shift. For centuries, the traditional form of government was a monarchy. Then a new paradigm was developed. A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. The 
constitutional democracy was born, unleashing tremendous human energy and ingenuity, and creating a standard of living, of freedom, of influence and hope unequaled in the history of the world. Not all paradigm shifts are in a positive direction. The view of success shifted from the character ethic to the personality ethic. Many people experience deep shifts in thinking when they experience a life-threatening crisis. Suddenly, they see their priorities in a different light or when they step into a new role, like that of a parent, spouse, or leader. Principles are deep fundamental truths with universal application. They apply to individuals, families, and private and public organizations of every kind. Principles are not values. A gang of thieves can share values, but they're in violation of the principles we're talking about. Principles are the territory. Values are the map. If a thief values stealing and robbing people of their possessions and their dignity, it doesn't matter how much money or power they get. Those values, that map, will lead to the corrosion of the soul and self-destruction. In life, there are sequential stages of growth. A child learns to turn over, sit, walk, cr crawl, walk, then run. We know and accept this principle of process in the physical areas, but it also applies to the emotional areas, human relations, and personal character. It's easy to fake it in these areas. It's not easy to fake physical proficiency. Can you imagine a professional tennis player or a concert pianist trying to fake their skills? A tennis player can talk a big game, but if they don't start beating their opponents, they're not getting very far. A concert pianist might talk their way to the stage, but what happens when they start playing and the audience realizes they've been duped? He or she would have to face the consequences. When I did a leadership course in the Air Force, I had a classmate who had to make a choice between being a pilot and playing professional football for the Dallas Cowboys. Every day after classes, training, presentations, challenges, he, I would see him working out nonstop in the gym or in the field, sprinting, running, lifting. He showed me a little notebook he had with all the exercises his trainer expected him to accomplish every day. He hadn't made the choice yet, but he knew he had to meet a certain level of standards and skills in order to even be considered. He had made that commitment to himself, and he developed the habits to make it happen. The seven habits move us on a maturity continuum, from dependence to independence to interdependence. We begin life as infants, completely dependent on our caregivers. Then over time, we become more physically, mentally, emotionally, and financially independent. We can take care of ourselves, become an interdirected and self-reliant. Then as we continue to grow and mature, we realize that there's an interdependent system that governs nature, including society. We discover that the highest reaches of our nature have to do with our relationship with, with others, and that human beings are also interdependent. On the maturity continuum, Dependence is a paradigm of, you take care of me, you come through for me. If you don't come through for me, I blame you for the results. Independence is a paradigm of, I can do it, I am responsible, I am self-reliant, I can choose. Interdependence is a paradigm of we. We can do it, we can cooperate, we can combine our talents and abilities and create something greater together. Our society's current emphasis on independence is a reaction to dependence, to having others manipulate, use, define, and use us. The little understood concept of interdependence appears to some as dependence. Therefore, we find people who, in the guise of independence, often for selfish reasons, leave their marriages, abandon their, their children, and forsake all kinds of responsibilities. We often see this champion in entertainment, in movies where characters take off their shackles, become li liberated, assert themselves, and do their own thing at the cost of themselves and others. This behavior reveals fundamental dependencies of letting the weaknesses of other people ruin our emotional lives and of feeling increasingly victimized 
by people and circumstances out of our control. True independence of character empowers us to act rather than be acted upon. But it is not the ultimate goal in effective living. Interdependence is a choice only independent people can make. A truly interdependent person has the opportunity to share themselves deeply and meaningfully with others and to have access to the vast resources and potential of other human beings. Habits 1, 2, and 3 deal with self-mastery. They are the private victories and the essence of character and growth. Once we become truly independent, we have the foundation for effective interdependence. The public victories found in habits 4, 5, and 6. Cooperation, teamwork, and communication. Habit 7 is a habit of renewal. Before I go over the seven habits, there is one last principle Stephen Covey identified as crucial for understanding the seven habits. The PPC balance, production slash production capability. To illustrate this, he used Aesop's fable of the goose and the golden egg. One day, a farmer realized that his goose was laying a golden egg every day. Eventually, he became greedy and impatient and killed the goose to get all the golden eggs. When he opened the goose, he realized there were no eggs and now the goose was dead. Many people see effectiveness from the golden egg paradigm. The more you do, the more you produce, the more effective you are. But as the story shows, true effectiveness is a function of two things. What is produced, the golden eggs, and the producing acid, or the capacity to produce, the goose. There are three types of assets, physical, financial, and human. Effectiveness lies in the balance. Excessive focus on production leads to ruined health, worn out machines, depleted bank accounts, and broken relationships. Too much focus on production capability is like the people who run three or four hours a day bragging about all the years they're adding to their lives, unaware they're spending them running. Or the person who goes to school endlessly, never producing anything, always li living on other people's golden eggs, the eternal student syndrome. Now I'm going to go over the seven habits of highly effective people. Private victory, habit one, be proactive. Being self-aware is what allows us to make or break our habits. Until we take into account how we see ourselves and how we see others, we will be unable to understand how others see and feel about themselves and their world. If the only vision we have of ourselves comes from the social mirror, from the opinions, perceptions, and paradigms of others, then our view of ourselves is like the reflection at, in the crazy mirror room at the carnival. There are often the projected concerns and character weaknesses of the people giving the input rather than accurately reflecting who we are. Productivity is more than merely taking initiative. It means we're responsible for our own lives. Our behavior is a result of our Condi or our decisions, not our conditions. We take the initiative and responsibility to make things happen. Look at the word responsibility, response, ability, the ability to choose a response. Proactive people recognize that responsibility. They don't blame circumstances, conditions, or conditioning for their circumstance, for their behavior. People who do empower those things to control them and become reactive. I explain reactivity and its negative impact in our lives in my therapy video. But reactive people are affected by their physical environment. If the weather is good, they feel good. If they have their coffee in the morning, they're in a good mood. If not, you better beware. Reactive people are also affected by their emotional environment. If people treat them well, they feel good. If not, they become protective and defensive. It's not what happens to us, but how we deal, how we react to what happens to us that hurts us. Of course, there are things that can hurt us physically or financially and cause us pain. But our character, our basic identity, doesn't have to be hurt at all. In fact, our most difficult experiences become the crucibles that forge our identity. 
and develop the internal powers and the freedom to handle difficult circumstances in the future. In this habit, Stephen Covey explains the difference between the circle of concern and the circle of influence. We have a wide variety of concerns, our health, our children, problems at work, national debt, nuclear war. We can se separate those things in which we have no particular emotional or mental involvement by creating a circle of concern. As we look at it, it becomes apparent that there are things over which we have no control. The things over which we do have control, we can put in a smaller circle of influence. Proactive people focus their efforts in their circle of influence. They work on things they can do something about. Their energy is positive, enlarging, magnifying, causing their circle of influence to increase. Reactive people focus their efforts in their circle of concern on the weaknesses of other people, problems in the environment, and circumstances over which they have no control. This focus results in blaming and accusing attitudes, reactive language, and feeling victimized by circumstances out of their control. This negativity, coupled with neglect in the areas they could do something about, causes their circle of influence to shrink. At the very heart of our circle of influence is our ability to make and keep commitments. The integrity to those commitments is the clearest manifestation of our productivity. Habit two, begin with the end in mind, principles of personal leadership. In this habit, Stephen Covey asks you to imagine the end of your life, your funeral, and four speakers from your immediate family, a friend, a colleague from your work or profession, and a member of your church or community organization. What would you like each of these speakers to say about you and your life? What kind of a parent were you? What kind of a daughter or son? What kind of a friend? What kind of a colleague? What kind of a person? What character would you like them to have seen in you? What achievements and contributions would you like them to remember? I didn't want to imagine my own funeral, but I did, and it gave me an awareness of the areas in my life that were lacking. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't think with everything that I do, what are my future children going to think? Is this something I want them to learn? Is this something they're going to look up to? If the answer is no, then chances are I shouldn't be doing it. If I can't be proud of my behavior and who I am in my own heart and in the eyes of the people I love, then something's wrong and I have to change myself or my behavior. As we saw in Habit 1, proactivity is based on self-awareness. There are two additional endowments that allows, allow us to expand our productivity and ex exercise personal leadership in our lives. Imagination and conscience. Through imagination, we can imagine uncreated worlds of potential that lie within us. Through conscience, we can come in contact with natural laws and principles, our unique talents and avenues of contribution. The most effective way Stephen Covey knew to begin with the end in mind was to create a personal mission statement, philosophy or creed. It focuses on who you want to be, your character, and what you want to do, your contributions and achievements, and on the values and principles upon which they are based. In order to write a personal mission statement, we have to begin at the very center of our circle of influence, our most basic paradigms. Whatever is at the center of your life will be the source of your security, guidance, wisdom, and power. Stephen Covey goes in depth into the alternate centers people normally have. I'm going to go over them briefly, but if you want to know more about everything I'm talking about, I highly recommend The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. As always, I link below the video anything I recommend and additional information. Some people are spouse-centered, deriving their emotional worth from their marriage or relationship and becoming highly dependent on the mood of the moment. Some people are family-centered, getting their security from family tradition, culture, and reputation. Money-centered people put aside family and other priorities, thinking 
that everyone will understand economic priorities come first. Work-centered people become workaholics, driven to produce at the cost of themselves and others. Possession-centered people focus on tangible possessions like fashionable clothes, cars, boats, homes, and jewelry, and on intangible possessions like fame, glory, and social prominence. Pleasure-centered people become almost entirely narcissistic, interpreting all of life in terms of the pleasure it brings to the self here and now. Their capacity lays dormant, their talents undeveloped, their mind and spirit become lethargic, and their hearts are unfulfilled. Friend or enemy-centered people are focused and dependent exclusively on one person, spiraling from need to conflict and creating negative interactions. Church-centered people are so focused on church worship and projects that they become insensitive to the human, to the pressing human needs around them, contradicting the very precepts they profess to believe. And finally, self-centered people are selfish and have little security, guidance, wisdom, and power. The ideal is to create a center based on correct principles. But principles have consequences. We can choose to walk in front of a bus, but we can't choose the consequences. There are positive consequences if we live in harmony with correct principles, and there are negative consequences if we don't. In order to write a personal mission statement, we also have to identify our roles and goals. For example, in my personal mission statement, my roles are child of God, individual, wife, mother, daughter, and sister, happy now Olivia, writer, and community citizen. When I was in the Air Force, another role was Air Force officer. A role I haven't actualized is the role of mother, but this is so supremely important to me, I'm preparing for it years in advance. I understand the incredible responsibility that it is to bring a child into this world, and part of my goals in this role are to be the best person and parent I can be, and to nourish my body so that I can have healthy babies and be an active and healthy parent. Writing your personal mission statement in terms of the important roles in your life gives you harmony and balance. Your goals are a reflection of your deepest values, unique talents, and sense of mission. You can also write family and organizational mission statements. Habit three, put first things first, principles of personal management. In this habit, Stephen Covey asks two questions. What one thing could you do, something you aren't doing now, something that if you did on a regular basis would have a tremendous positive influence in your personal life? What one thing could you do in your work or professional life that would bring similar results? Habit three is the actualization and fulfillment of habits one and two. It's the exercise of independent will towards becoming principle-centered. It's the day in and day out, moment by moment, doing it by exercising effective self-management. Effective management is putting first things first. Leadership decides what first things are. Management is the discipline to carry it out. Rather than focusing on things in time, Effective self-management focuses on enhancing and preserving relationships and on accomplishing results. An effective time management matrix is divided in four ways. And the two factors that define activity are urgent and important. Picture a time management matrix where on the top left is the urgent important quadrant one. Crises, pressing problems, deadline driven projects. On the right is not urgent, important quadrant two, prevention, production capability activities, relationship building, recognizing new opportunities, planning and recreation. At the bottom left is the not urgent, is the urgent, not important quadrant three, interruptions, some mails, calls, reports, meetings, pressing matters and popular activities. At the bottom right is the not urgent, not important quadrant four. Trivia, busy work, some calls, mails, mail, 
and pleasant activities. Some people are consumed by Quadrant 1. They're crisis managers, problem-minded people, deadline-driven producers. As long as they keep focused, they keep their focus on Quadrant 1, it will keep getting bigger until it dominates them. Their only relief is to escape to the not important, not urgent activities of Quadrant 4. Effective people stay out of Quadrants 3 and 4 because urgent or not, they're not important. They also shrink Quadrant 1 by spending more time in Quadrant 2. Quadrant 2 is the heart of effective personal management. The activities in Quadrant 2 have the kind of impact that if we do them, take quantum leaps. The way you spend your time is the way you see your time and your priorities. Stephen Covey developed a fantastic management tool center around Quadrant 2. He believed that planning on a weekly basis provided more context and balance than daily planning. The key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. In the Seven Habits book, there is a wonderful template for the Quadrant 2 Weekly Planner. Public Victory, Habit 4, Think Win-Win. There are six paradigms of human interaction. Win-win, win-lose, lose-win, lose-lose, win, and win or no deal. Win-win is a frame of heart and mind that seeks mutual benefit in all human interactions. It means that all solutions and agreements are mutually beneficial and satisfying. Win-lose is the authoritarian approach. I get my way, you don't get yours. Win-lose people are prone to using position, possessions, power, credentials, and personality to get their way. Lose-win has no standards, demands, expectations, or vision. People who think lose-win are often quick to appease. They seek strength from popularity and acceptance and have little courage to express their own feelings or convictions and are usually easily intimidated. Lose-lose is when two determined, stubborn, and ego-invested individuals, individuals interact. They both become vindictive and want to get back or get even. Lose-lose is also the philosophy of the highly dependent person who is without inner direction, who is miserable and who believes everyone else should be miserable too. People who think win don't necessarily want other people to lose, but that's irrelevant. What matters is that they get their way. Of these five options, which is best? It depends on the circumstances. If you're playing a competitive sport, then win loses what you want. If your child's life is in danger, then win is all that matters. In a relationship, sometimes a compromise of lose-win may be beneficial. But most human interactions are, are in an interdependent reality, and win-win is the only viable alternative. Win or no deal is an agreement that it's better to have no agreement than to make a decision that is not right for both parties. Win-win is not a personality technique. It comes from a character of strength, maturity, and the abundance mentality, that there's plenty for everybody, that one person's success is not achieve, achieved at the expense or exclusion of someone else's success. Win-win is achieved through the process we're going to talk about in Habits 5 and 6. Habit 5, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Principles of empathic communication. Communication is the most important skill in life. There are four basic types of communication. We spend years learning how to read, write, and speak. But what training or education do most of us have that enables us to listen so we can deeply understand another human being? We have to build what Stephen Covey called an emotional bank account like in a financial bank account where we make deposits of money and withdrawals. In an emotional bank account, we want to make deposits of love and trust with people. Seek first to understand is a deep shift in paradigm. We typically seek to be understood first. We listen with the intent to reply, 
we're usually speaking or preparing to speak, filtering everything for, through our own paradigms and reading our own autobiographies into other people's lives. Empathic listening is not active or reflective listening, which involves an individual mimicking what the other person is saying. Empathic listening is listening with the intent to understand by getting into another person's frame of reference. Walking in their shoes, you see the world how they see the world and you understand how they feel. Empathic listening is risky. It takes a great deal of internal security to go into a deep listening experience because you open yourself up to be influenced. You become vulnerable. It's a paradox in a sense because in order to influence, you have to be influenced. When people are given the opportunity to open up, they unravel their own problems and solutions become apparent to them in the process. Habit 5 is powerful because it's right at the center of our circle of influence. To many people, it's the most exciting, immediately applicable of the seven habits. Habit 6, synergize. Principles of creative cooperation. Synergy is the highest activity in all life. It's the truest test and manifestation of all other habits put together. It means that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. When we communicate synergistically, we open ourselves up to the creative process. It takes an incredible amount of internal security to begin with a spirit of adventure, discovery, and creativity. You have to leave your comfort zone, explore unknown wilderness, and have the potential to be a trailblazer, a pathfinder, open new possibilities, territories, and continents so that others may follow. Valuing the emotional and psychological differences between people is the essence of synergy. A truly effective person has the humility and reverence to accept his own perceptual limitations and to appreciate the rich resources available through interactions with the hearts and minds of other human beings. Habit 7. Sharpen the saw. Principles of Balanced Self-Renewal. This is my favorite habit and the one that makes all others possible. Habit seven is production capability. It's preserving and enhancing the most important asset we have, ourselves. It's renewing the four dimensions of our nature, physical, spiritual, mental, and social emotional. Renewing the physical dimension entails taking care of our bodies, eating the right foods, getting enough rest and relaxation, and exercising on a regular basis. Renewing the spiritual dimension provides personal leadership to our lives. It's our core, our commitment to our value system. It draws upon the sources that inspire, uplift, and tie us to the timeless truths of humanity. The mental dimension involves continuing education, honing and expanding the mind through reading, writing, planning and visualizing. The social emotional dimension is primarily but not exclusively developed out of and manifested in our personal relationships. Any dimension that is neglected will lead to negativity and push against effectiveness and growth. Renewal is the principle that empowers us to move on an upward spiral of change, growth and continuous improvement. Stephen Covey called sharpening the saw in the first three dimensions, the daily private victory. And he advocated doing these activities for at least one hour a day, every day for the rest of your life. It will affect every decision and relationship, improving the quality and effectiveness of every other hour of the day, including the depth and restfulness of your sleep. And it will build a long-term physical, mental, and spiritual strength to handle the difficult challenges in life. And there are no shortcuts in renewing any of the dimensions. The law of the harvest governs. We will always reap what we sow, no more, no less. I share with you much of the wisdom in the seven habits of highly effective people, which has truly empowered my life. But the real joy in this book comes from reading the many 
personal stories Stephen Covey shared, his experiences, struggles, and victories as a human being, father, husband, colleague, and friend. Stephen Covey was a man in control of his own destiny by taking charge of the purpose in his life to teach people about the principles of effective living. He has touched millions of lives and he will touch millions more because the legacy he left behind is bigger than one man. It lives in his work. It endures in the example of how he lived his life and embodied the principles he believed in. Crystallized in the pages of his book are his self-awareness, imagination, conscience, and independent will. My favorite part about this book is the tribute Stephen Covey's children give him in the beginning, titled, A Covey Family Tribute to a Highly Effective Father. The love, respect, and admiration Stephen Covey's children feel for him is so palpable and sincere. Stephen Covey was triumphed as a leader of men, not just because he had the vision to harness these natural laws and principles and make them available to people. He triumphed first and foremost because he was the best human being he could be, the best father and the best husband. He used to pose a question in his teachings. How many people in their deathbeds wish they spend more time at the office or watching TV. The answer is no one. They think of their loved ones, of their families, and of those they have served. The seven habits give you the power to choose, to explore and discover your deepest, most cherished purpose, and to create and control your future. Working on the seven habits is an ongoing journey. Never forget that the single most powerful investment you can make in life is the investment in yourself. You are the most beautiful and important goose. If you don't take care of yourself, your loved ones and the world won't get to see the amazing, shiny, golden eggs you're capable of producing. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it. And consider subscribing so you can get the latest Happy Now Olivia video. In addition, I'd love to hear in the comments below how working on the seven habits has affected your life and your relationships. Remember, happiness is an active choice. You don't have to wait. You too can be happy now. Thanks for watching. See you next time.